I think Chris, what do you think you're on the far left or far right? Uh, I think far left. Yeah, far left. So maybe we can have you right here on the far right then. So if you could take that seat. Right next yeah. to the podium. Mm -hmm. Page. Uh, 207. He had to go get the audition. You yeah, can get. Okay, I'm going to start with you. Can get accustomed to a loss of dignity. What page? I, I don't know. 207. Oh, sorry. Then I'm going to stop right here. Then I'm going to go to the next page. And start with my Achilles Badness. And stop there. Yeah, I would actually love to go to the first part. Okay. I, didn't know. I think it's like catchy and, you know, I wish I wasn't so sick. I'm just trying to get better before New York. I know, I'm kind of worried about that. I'm going. Okay. Uh, I've been in bed for two days, so. Uh, I just can't get sick because I have to go to France next week after we go to New York. Yeah. And then what after that? That's a huge amount right there. It's a 14 hour flight. I know. So, um, poor thing. You're still really sick. Uh, it's okay, though. I'm here. Okay, you made it. Yes. I will be giving it to you. Yeah. Is that Chewy back there? Where? In the he's back? He's in his work clothes. No, he's still. Yeah, he's right oh, there. there he is. Yeah, okay. I'll go say hi, Rob. Yes, yeah. Okay. Let me go get water.
Okay.
Good evening, everyone. If you could please take your seats. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the Central Library. My name is Joyce Cooper, and I'm a principal librarian here at Central Library, and I manage programming and outreach. We are so happy that you're here tonight for this wonderful event with the National Book Foundation. If you've never been here before, um, we hope that this will not be your last time coming here. This is a wonderful library. This building alone holds over 2 million items. And we see about 1,600 visitors a day. And this building has been in this spot since 1926. So there's lots of history to see. We have a wonderful docent group that gives free tours of the building every day. So if you're interested in learning more, please come back. Also, for those of you that don't have a library card, I strongly encourage you to apply for one. It's free, and as the LA Weekly said, we are the best card in LA, and we are. Um, <laughs> if, you don't, um, if you only do eBooks or eMedia, we have one of the largest eMedia collections in the country, so our card will get you some free classes, get you a high school diploma, get you books, um, help you learn a new language, and check out books like everyone else. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Lisa Lucas, the Executive Director of the MBF. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Lisa. Um, so we're really happy to be here tonight um, in Los Angeles. Um, we are based in New York City, and so we don't always end up in other states, but we are here tonight. Um, really happy to be at the Los Angeles Public Library, which is gorgeous as always. Um, and we're live streaming tonight, so that's exciting. So this will be something that people can keep watching and they will get to know about the Literature for Justice books. Um, so I'm gonna start by talking a little bit about the National Book Foundation. Presumably you've heard of us because you are here, um, but people often um, equate us with the National Book Awards, which is our largest program. And every year we celebrate literature in America and we have a big, big party, um, a large fancy dinner. Um, and it always felt like that. It felt like that was the thing that we did, that we were kind of this exclusive fancy night where publishing celebrated itself and celebrated books. Um, but that's not really what we do. Uh, we are designed to celebrate the best literature in America, to expand its audience, and to ensure that books have a prominent place in American culture. And so to do that, we can't just celebrate the books, we have to build the audience, right? So we do educational programming, we do public programming, um, and we're really excited to be growing. Um, so we have Book Rich Environments, which is a project which gives out, to date, almost 700,000 books to public housing authorities around the country. Um, we have NBF Presents, which we just started this year, which is going to be taking National Book Award honored authors out on the road to nearly 40 events this year. Um, we do a writer-led book club for middle school students called Book Up and a lot more. Um, but ultimately, we just believe that books matter, right? They actually do something. They're not just smart or fancy um, or stories. They are things that help to inform our lives and to inspire us towards action. Um, 
And we also believe that books hold the power to illuminate the world that we live in, to understand people and places and things that we don't naturally understand ourselves. Um, and so that's what drove us towards Literature for Justice, right? This is one of the first programs that we've done um, that specifically deals with a topic or issue. Um, and so Literature for Justice is a book-based national campaign um, that seeks to contextualize, humanize, and render more real the causes and effects of mass incarceration in the United States. And so tonight, this is our first event since we've launched the program. Um, we're gonna talk about how these books can tell a story about America's carceral system and what it means for all Americans. Um, so I'm gonna do a couple things and then I'm gonna introduce everybody and then I'm gonna get out of here so you can actually hear from the authors. Um, so first, big thanks to the LA Public Library team, Joyce Cooper, Diane Olivia Posner, Eva Mitnick, Ani Boyajan uh, and Russell Pyle for their support, partnership, and bringing this event together in this beautiful space. Skylight Books for being here to sell the titles to you tonight. Please buy them. You can borrow them too with your library card that you will sign up for if you have not already. Um, I'd like to thank Whitney Who and Nicole Swift for putting the whole thing together. Um, and then the... And then the Art for Justice Fund and Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors for giving us the opportunity to continue their mission by engaging in literature with a broad audience. Um, and so finally, I want to thank and acknowledge our Literature for Justice Committee. Um, this is the first year of three years that we're going to be doing this, and so we assembled five folks, five brilliant geniuses to help us pick five books that we thought everyone should read about mass incarceration. Um, at the end of these three years, we will have 15 committee members and 15 books. Um, this year, we were very lucky to be joined by James Foreman Jr., who was a 2017 National Book Award honored author and was awarded the 2018 Pulitzer Prize for Nonfiction for his first book, Locking Up Our Own Crime and Punishment in Black America. He was also a law clerk for Justice Sandra Day O'Connor of the US Supreme Court. He was a public defender in DC and started an alternative school for dropouts and youth. And Sergio de la Pava. He's the author of three novels, including Lost Empress. He's also a lifelong public defender and the legal director at the New York County Defender Services in Manhattan, where he represents indigent criminal defendants and advocates for large scale justice reform. He also recently just gave every new public defender on his team a copy of Upstate because he believes that even those doing the work can't lose sight of the actual stories of impacted people in their lives, which we thought was a fun anecdote. Uh, Mitch Jackson, who's the author of The Residue Years, where his own experiences inspired the novel. Um, he grew up in a neglected neighborhood in Portland, Oregon, and was sent to prison for selling drugs. He is now a professor at New York University, winner of a Whiting Award, TED Fellow, and advocate for criminal justice reform. Our last two committee members are here with us. That's very exciting. We have Rachel Kushner, who is a 2013 Fiction National Book Award finalist for her book, The Flamethrowers, and a 2008 finalist for Telex from Cuba. Her new book, The Mars Room, was shortlisted for the Booker Prize. Her latest novel takes you inside a women's prison and sheds light on what it means to be poor and female in America. She's on the advisory board of Justice Now, which advocates against human rights abuses in California's women's prisons, and is a passionate advocate who has dedicated thousands of hours towards, we know that you have dedicated thousands of hours, towards advocating on the behalf of and working with incarcerated, the incarcerated in California. And last but not least, we have Dr. Heather Ann Thompson, a 2016 National Book Award finalist for her book, Blood in the Water, The Attica Prison Uprising of 1971 and Its Legacy. She's a public intellectual and often writes on the history of policing, mass incarceration, and the current criminal justice system for the New York Times, The Atlantic, NBC, and Rolling Stone, where she wrote about why Meek Mills released from prison matters. Together, these bright minds brainstormed a list of books, read them, and then spent hours debating which ones would be the ones to feature in the inaugural reading list to set the tone and narrative over the next few years. The 2018-2019 Literature for Justice reading list consists of five books. Four of the five titles are written or feature voices of those who are formerly or currently incarcerated. The voices featured in these books include Black, Latinx, Native, trans, women, and more. The foundation is incredibly proud of this work and excited about these books, and we're grateful to our committee for picking them. So 
if you are unsure where to start to learn more about the subject, these five books or the books that our committee members have read are a great place to begin. And with that, I will get off the stage and stop running my mouth and invite Heather Ann Thompson to the stage. Good evening. Good to see all of you out here. Thank you, Lisa, for getting us started here. Um, so I'm Heather Thompson, and I'm here uh, with just, um, I'm, I'm so thrilled to be here. We, we have before you some of the most in incredible authors and voices, and um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about each of the books. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the committee we were on. We were uh, the Committee of Literature for Justice, as Lisa described it. And we are the first of three years where we're gonna do this, where we're gonna think about what are the most critical readings out there on the topic of criminal justice. Um, what gives us the needed perspective as we think about what's both wrong with this system, but also what we might imagine differently for the system. And in this inaugural year of the initiative, the committee chose a body of literature that critically and anecdotally explores our nation's prisons and the crisis specifically of mass incarceration. The committee felt it essential to select readings that would illuminate myriad elements of this issue. Why this country came to lock up more people than any other, how different groups in our society experience prison, and how the society could build new methods and systems to respond to the myriad social ills that land so many people behind bars. Equally important was selecting readings from, readings from various genres, from historical nonfiction and memoir, fiction, poetry. Throughout the, throughout the selection process, the 2018 selectors were also deeply committed to foregrounding the work of formerly incarcerated authors. So with that, I am really thrilled to introduce each book to you. I'll introduce each one. Each author will come up, give you a reading from their selected book, and we'll end the evening with a conversation between the authors and one of my fellow panelists that helped choose these books. And you'll get to hear a little bit more of the, the behind the scenes of the importance of these books. So the first book that we're gonna hear from tonight, or the first author, is Kalisha Buchanan. Her book, Upstate, a powerful, powerful story told through letters, a young love put to the test, and an, unforget excuse me, an unforgettable coming of age story with a message of undeniable hope. Sergio de la Pava, one of our committee members, noted that this novel's forceful achievement has, was a forceful achievement. The dirty streets of this country's mass incarceration program, the great civil rights malfunction of our time in this novel feels so lyric, so personal. The book can only further our understanding of the devastating impact decades of illegitimate policing has had and should be required reading for anyone hoping to contribute to meaningful reform. Kalisha Buchanan is the winner of the American Library Association Alec Award and Friends of American Writers Award. She's been nominated for a Pushcart Prize, a Hearst and Wright Foundation Legacy Award, and she has a new novel, which we're very excited about, Speaking of Summer, coming out soon. Please help, help me in welcoming Kalisha Buchanan to the stage. Thank you so much to the National Book Foundation and Art for Justice for doing this program. I was very surprised that they would recognize my work after all this time, um, and just very honored that you know to, for Upstate to be thought of for this program in this way. Um, the character I'm going to read from is one of the main characters. A couple they write to each other for ten years letters. And um, this is just a portion of the letter from the young man who's incarcerated and his girlfriend's free. Last night I had a dream. I was back on the outside and my mother gave me a party at the house. I could smell food, but I couldn't see it. Fried chicken mostly, some apple pie and biscuits and my favorite banana pudding. It was one of them big welcome home signs hanging from wall to wall in the living room and it said by Tyler and Trevon at the bottom. And everybody in the whole world who knew my name was there. You, people from school, my lawyer, the detectives that came to pick me up, the warden, my teacher, Mr. Cook, 
them guys, MGD and Mookie I told you about, Benito, Muhammad, my brothers and aunts and cousins and neighbors. I mean, not their whole body because we only got two bedrooms and a tiny kitchen and it's only so much that can fit. But it was like they was there and I felt them and I saw everybody's face floating in the air, so thin and shadow-like that I could put my hand through it, poke my fingers through their eyes and mouth without them frowning or squinting. My body felt weak and loose, like while I was walking, parts of me was falling off, hitting the ground without a sound. I didn't care about picking them up and saving them for later so a doctor could put them back on. There was only one person who was there, and he was whole in the flesh. It was my daddy, sitting on the couch with the Ramon in one hand and a bottle of vodka in the other. He had on this checkered robe me and my brother's bottom at Harlem Mart for Father's Day. I think he was naked up under it because it was open, so I could see far up his thighs and his stomach rolling soft and yellow like a little puppy's belly. And he looked at me and smiled and said, Tony, do you want some eggs? You want some eggs? And I smiled because Daddy ain't called me Tony since I was a little boy. And I said, while I heard all the people in the world talking and laughing and singing old songs, I knew, yeah, Daddy, that sounds good. And he put down his drink and tied up his robe, and he got up and pat my shoulder real quick and soft when he passed me. And he said, okay, Tony, come on, let me fix you some eggs. That's it. Thank you. This is the thing that the, the uh, National Book Foundation does beautifully. It's the best part of being at the awards. It's the getting to hear people read from their books. And I'm so glad we're getting to do that tonight as well. So the next book, um, it's a real pleasure to introduce. It's called Inside This Place, Not Of It, Narratives from Women's Prisons, edited by Robin Levi and Ilet Wild Waldman. Inside This Place, Not Of It is an oral history that shares in their own words, 13 narrators and their lives leading up to incarceration and their struggle for survival once inside. My fellow panelist Rachel Kutchner said about this book that it is, that it has an honesty and a wide range of voices that make it an obvious choice for a reading list aiming to highlight awareness of the experiences of those sucked into the justice system. And the ethical project of Voice, for, uh, Voice of Witness, the series in which Inside This Place was published, which aims to provide oral histories by those directly impacted by human rights violations, seemed exactly in tune with our project and the books we wanted to highlight. And I will just say as an aside, this is not on my script, but my students absolutely love this book. So I'm so glad to share that with you. And reading for Inside This Place, Not Of It, will be Teresa Martinez, an activist who is one of the featured narratives from the book. Please help me in welcoming Teresa to the stage. Please excuse me, I have a really bad cold, but I'm here, right? Um, before I start reading, I want to thank the National Book Foundation for making this possible for our voices and our stories to be heard. It's extremely important for everybody to know what mass incarceration is about and what it does to us and how it affects families also. Um, I also want to thank <coughs> my editors are here and this book would not be possible if it wasn't for them. <coughs> so I want to thank them. And I also want to thank everybody that's here <coughs> supporting <laughs> supporting this cause. It's really important that you hear our voices so that you understand what incarceration is really about and what really happens inside the prison system. <clears throat> the first time I was sent to prison, I was 18. I was convicted of possession, transportation, and sales of PCP. <clears throat> I had a large quantity of apple juice bottles of that stuff. My first trip to prison was for six years and I've pretty much been in and out since then. Now I'm in my mid-40s, and, and the first institution I was taken under the wing of lifers who knew I was a baby and couldn't take care of myself. <coughs> a lot of them played mom, a lot of them played sister, and they taught me the morals and principles of how to carry yourself, the do's and the don'ts of surviving in prison. I learned that you have to carry yourself right and carry yourself with respect. It's hard to explain how degrading prison is to someone who's never experienced it. You are told when to wake up, when you can bathe, when you can brush your teeth. 
You stand for 20 minutes waiting for a door to open just so you can walk in a line and go eat. You're given three minutes to shovel down your food. Then you're right back in that line waiting for your door to open again so you can go put yourself away. Through all this, you have constant yelling over the intercom. There's a lot of heartache, a lot of crime, a lot of violence and chaos crammed into a building with 200 women. You've got 200 different kinds of cultural backgrounds, ethics, beliefs, attitudes, and emotions. You've got 200 different ways of processing emotions. There are some women who can't read, some who weren't even taught how to shower. They come in here and they are stripped of their dignity. They can't even go to the bathroom without male staff watching. You can get so accustomed to the loss of dignity <coughs> that your standards just disappear. Some women come in who have never even taken off their clothes in front of their own husbands. They get so upset and so embarrassed, they cry. What makes me the saddest is that I find myself <coughs> hardening up saying things to them like, why are you, what are you crying about? I have to remind myself to have compassion. Just because I'm used to it doesn't mean someone else is. <coughs> it's so sad to see women coming here who really don't know how to deal with prison. They've never been out of their homes. They're in here for ridiculous stuff, making bad decisions, helping someone out. They were just so naive and gullible that another person was able to reel them in. And they're, and they're incarcerated with people who've committed murder. It's like one pit, everybody's thrown into one pit. In the middle of 1990, I was diagnosed with HIV while I was in jail. I was seen by officers from the public health department interviewed and counseled and given a blood test. It came back positive. <laughs> and I have to say I wasn't surprised with my history of drug use and the prostitution. It all made sense. But you can imagine this diagnosis was devastating to me. I even tried to commit suicide. I was sent to prison to the chronic care program where they kept people with chronic illnesses in the CCP and I had restrictions galore. I couldn't go to any other prison. I wasn't eligible for transfer to less restrictive institutions, and I was medicated for almost 10 years on three combinations of HIV therapy. They tested my white blood cell count and it would come back really low. They screened my blood for my viral load and the results would be terrible. The side effects of the medication were awful, vomiting, diarrhea. Every day I had to stand in the med line, sometimes for hours in the heat. I was also regularly sent for x-rays with the other HIV women. And of course, because of the open treatment and the marked bags of medication, everyone knew I was HIV positive. People would harass me. The CLs would discriminate against me. The whole system discriminates against HIV patients. For example, in 1999, I wanted a transfer to Valley State Prison. They had just opened a dry cleaning vocational training program, and I was a perfect candidate for it. The prison agreed that I fit all the criteria and she'd be sent to the program. Then they decided they weren't going to house HIV inmates at Valley State. <coughs> they were going to keep them in one place so they could be treated together. Then in 2007, after more than a decade and a half of aggressive treatment, the prison finally decided to retest me. The, taste, the test came back negative. It turned out that I was not HIV positive. I had never been. This negative result was confirmed in 2008. The first HIV test they did back in 1990 was wrong. I'll never know <coughs> what happened to the original lab reports, whether they were falsified or whether it was just due to in incompetence. They retested me a few times as recently as last year and I'm still testing negative. But at the same time, I worry that maybe I have a special strain of HIV that just not showing and I'm gonna pop up with full-blown AIDS a few years from now. I can't stop thinking, how could I have so many lab tests that showed high viral loads in my blood? I'm scared. As it is, there are so many diseases, like with the hepatitis, they got the whole alphabet now. How do they know that I don't have a silent strain of HIV that's just hiding? I have no access in prison to medical information beyond what they tell me. That's what it's like to have a disease in prison. You have no information. You don't know the truth. In fact, you don't even, you don't even know if you can trust the last test. After all this happened, I petitioned for a hearing with the chief medical officer. Before a prison can bring a lawsuit against the Department of Corrections, they first have to file a house, a house grievance. It took me exactly nine months from the time I filed the grievance for the chief medical officer to hear and interview me. 
When I walked into the hearing room, there was a whole panel of people, medical officers, public health officials, nurses. They were ready for me. The public health nurse who initially sent me to be tested claimed that she never interviewed me. But how else would I have been referred for treatment? She insisted they had no record of that, that she didn't recall it. It was ridiculous. We all knew that I'd been treated for HIV, but she kept insisting she'd never given me the diagnosis. The people on the panel claimed that it wasn't their fault, that they simply treated me for the disease they, they were told that I had. They refused to acknowledge that they were the ones who told me that I had the disease. Thank you. Thank you so much, Teresa. The next book that we're going to share with you tonight is a book of poetry. And unfortunately, the author cannot be here tonight, so Lisa will do the reading. But this is an incredible book. It's called Shahid Reads His Own Palm by Dwayne, or what I call him Dwayne, by Reginald Dwayne Betts. Uh, this is a collection of soulful poems. It captures a terrifying and heart-wrenching moment of his life uh, through poetry in prison. Um, one of our fellow, uh, I don't know why I'm so tongue-tied. <laughs> one of her fellow panelists, Mitchell Jackson, shared about this book that for most Americans, mass incarceration is an abstraction, sometimes qu quantified on the news and in documentaries with graphs and large figures. Betts has, Betts has evidenced himself as one who understands mass incarceration, though, as a national crisis, as a personal crisis. His poems are revelatory, wise, poignant, and help to re-envision mass incarceration and the prison industrial complex as what they are at the elemental level, humans failing humans. And Lisa will go and read us from that. Uh, Dwayne sends his regrets tonight. He really wanted to be here. Um, and he said a few words about, um, about his work and being selected. So. One of the strangest things to happen to contemporary poets, to me particularly, is to have my poems read. Writing about prison, about the lives of men and women who are amongst the most despised in our country is not something one does and hopes to find an audience. And yet here we are, in a place where on this stage and in small concerns across the country, poetry has done what poetry does, find an audience. I'm immensely grateful because the first folks to call me poet called prison cells their home. And more than anything else, my relationships with them are the gravity that pulls my writing again and again towards prison. May they all one day be free. Uh, he asked that we read two of his poems um, from the collection. And the first poem is called Prison. Prison, the sinner's bouquet, house of shredded and torn. Dear John letters, upended grave of names, moon, Black kiss of a pistol's flat side, time blue-born and threaded into a curse. Lazarus of hustlers, the picayune spinning into beatdowns. Breath of a thief stilled by fluorescent lights, a system of 40 blocks, empty vials, a handful of purple cranes bills. Memories of crates suspended from stairs, tied in knots around street lamps, the hours of unending push-ups, wheelbarrows, and walking twenties, the daughters chasing their father's shadows, sons that upset the wind with their secrets, the paraphrase of fractured, scarred wings flying through smoke, each wild hour of lockdown, hunger time, and the blackened flower. The second poem is called Ghazal. Ghazal. Some lies multiply and then blunt breath, or they flare out into hot, brilliant breath. What secret died with the jail's shorn locks? How to unlock woman's silent breath? So many black men, brown men in prison, is there a name for such migrant breath? Kix has spent three decades in prison. Who writes stories with his absent breath? Dreamweaver, my lover, spurns my kiss. She walks away, takes a giant breath. Cry, slowly with the force of whispers, and let it strut with strong elephant breath. Banger, speed, shank, steel, ice pick, razor, jail slang for knife, for violent breath. Oh, judge, I have swallowed silences, silences. On your ear, I blow my lucent breath. Sentenced to life in prison, life in prison. 
what judge declares more to shunt breath. Shahid waits, listens to the stars, his mind as a cell, blow through it ancient breath. Thank you, Lisa. It was important also for our committee to have a book on our list that set the context for the other books to give us a sense of how we could possibly have ended up uh, incarcerating more human beings, not just in any other country, but also more than at any other time in our own history. And that book that we chose was by James Kilgore called Understanding Mass Incarceration, A People's Guide to the Key Civil Rights Struggle of Our Time. And I was the person that wrote um, the caption for that book. Uh, and what I wrote was that the committee felt it essential that readers were given an understanding of mass incarceration's origin story. How is it that the United States came to imprison more people than any other country in the world? But it was also important that we had some thoughts on how we might imagine a more humane and equitable justice system in the future. In ways powerfully and accessibly, Kilgore does this and offers just this sort of historical background while also keeping us all, with all also helping us all to appreciate the vast reach and destructive impact of today's car carceral apparatus and why we should indeed try to create a different justice future. James Kilgore is a social justice activist and a formerly incarcerated educator himself. He writes widely and regularly on issues pertaining to mass incarceration. And he's a research scholar at the Center for African Studies at the University of Illinois. Please help me in welcoming James Kilgore to the stage. Thanks very much, Heather, and thank you to the National Book Foundation for bringing everybody together and for honoring this book. It's, it's amazing to, be, to actually be here. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Lisa and Whitney and Nicole for making this happen, and also my editor, Diane Wachtel from the New Press, for also making this happen. Um, I've brought with me a special copy of this book, and I hope I can do it justice. This is the copy that I gave to my mother. Um, she passed away last year at age 104. Um, so she, she had a good long life. Uh, but this is what I said to in, in, in the inside cover. I said, dear mom, thanks to all your love and support. Over the years, I can keep writing books. You are the best. Love, Jim. And I, I just want to make sure that people understand that my mother stood by me for 27 years of the time that I was a fugitive and six and a half years that I was incarcerated. And she was only four foot 10, but she stood tall through all of that. And I think for those of us who have been incarcerated, we know that our loved ones do that time with us and that we can't stay strong without having them also giving us the kind of support. So I've had that support not only from my mother, but from, but from many other, from many other uh, family members, um, my wife, my children, and through, and a number of people that have been uh, in solidarity with me across the years as I've been involved in struggles for social justice. So I wanted to read the last bit of the book, which is called, When Does Mass Incarceration End? Mark Maurer, director of the Sentencing Project, estimated in 2014 that at the rate of decrease in the prison population from 2000 to 2012, it would take 88 years to reach the per capita incarceration rates of 1980. Clearly too long. Maurer's scenario raises another question. Can mass incarceration be ended without a massive release of people from prisons and jails? Even if such a mass release did take place, when could we actually pronounce mass incarceration dead? Is Maurer's reference point, 1980, the goal? Has it ended when all the harsh sentencing laws are off the books? When the racial bias has been removed from our police and court practices? When a certain number of prisons and jails have been closed down? 
when everyone on, on in parole or probation is employed and adequately housed? Or is an end to mass incarceration more a spiritual or philosophical turning point beyond which criminal justice focuses on developing human beings and creating opportunities for communities rather than punishing criminals who are regarded as second-class citizens? Is it a moment when youth of color feel free to walk down the street without worrying about harassment or arrest? And when women or transgender folks have no fear of physical or sexual violence? For some people, mass incarceration may not end until every prison is shuttered, until the United States has become a society where even those guilty of the most harmful acts are given the opportunity for redemption and to be treated with the respect all human beings deserve. For the moment, the United States remains a long way from an end to mass incarceration. Understanding how the system works, in particular, who wins and loses from the largest expansion of carceral facilities in human history is an important starting point, but there is much more to be done. Thank you. All right. Well, last but absolutely not least, we have another beautiful book by Jimmy Santiago Baca called A Place to Stand. This is a harrowing and brilliant memoir of Baca's time before, during, and after years spent in maximum security prison. Uh, our fellow panelist James Foreman wrote about the book. A Place to Stand reminds us that while mass incarceration is often viewed as a black-white binary, the Latinx community makes up 20% of the U.S. incarcerated population. Baca's lyrical first-person account of life before, during, and after incarceration is both tender and gut-wrenching. It will leave readers asking what we can do to send fewer people to prison in the first place and how we can help those who were incarcerated return to our communities successfully. And reading A Place to Stand will be Antonio Baca, Jimmy Santiago Baca's son. And after Antonio reads, my colleague and fellow Literature for Justice Committee member, Rachel Kushner, will join, the state, join us on stage alongside these readers and authors uh, for a discussion about why these books matter and how they'll change the way we think about mass incarceration. So welcome, Antonio, to the stage. So I'd like to thank the Literature for Justice for bringing us here because it's, a, it's a, a cause that we feel so passionate about. Um, so that's why I said, you know, yes to come for my dad because he couldn't be here. He definitely wants to express his extreme gratitude for, you know, the selection of his book. Uh, so, so this book outlines his, basically his life. Uh, first, you know, he was in an orphanage, uh, then a brief stint at school, you know, then, you know, dropped out of school, then went to prison. So this is a brief little excerpt out of his book that I want to read to you guys. Um, it's while he was in the, the D home and his attempt to go to school. So I think that that's important because that's when, you know, you feel self-worth and either hope is lost or hope continues. Um, Low Blow was one of the guys in my cell, a big muscle Chicano whose fighting abilities were renowned. He took me under his wing, strutting down the halls in the rec room. He told me, never talk to guards. If anybody looks at you wrong, or tries to touch you, mess them up. What's a wrong look, he asks, and answered his own question. It's when they stare at you like they owe you money, or like you owe them money, rather. Like you did them wrong, and they're holding a grudge against you. The way starved dogs looked at each other over a piece of meat, and none of them want to share. During the chores, during chores one, last, one day, low, bro, low blow decked a guy who was put in, and he was put in isolation. With my partner gone, I had to assume an attitude of fearlessness, walk the walk, even though I desperately wanted Mayo to come. Mayo was his brother. He's still at the orphanage at this time. I waited as the days blurred into boring weeks, planning that when my father and mother had finally got together, I'd work as a gas station, or I'd work at a gas station, or as a laborer and make money. Without mother or Martina, it would be the same, or it wouldn't be the same. At least I'd have Mayo and my father. As the warm, sunny days passed, I kept myself busy, hoping for the best. I made my bunk every morning and swept the cell and when Loblo came out, he bunked next to me, and we both mopped the halls, washed windows, and exercises. 
or an exercise. It wasn't that bad, except during the night when I worried about my brother and father, fearing something might have happened to them. I prayed to God to help them as the halls echoed with ominous reports of guards boots as he checked to see if we were all in our bunks and counted. I felt sorry for the kids and for murder, grand theft auto or drug possession because I knew that they were headed for Springer, a prison for teenagers. Low Blow was going there for assault with a deadly weapon. And even though he said he wasn't afraid, I knew he was. With no word from my brother or father, the director decided it was time for me to go to school. Since the detention center had no educational facility, I was enrolled at Harrison Junior High. It was still dark and cold when he unlocked the main door one morning and led me into the cold dawn to the street curb. He told me to wait for a woman to pick me up and offered a brief pep talk to do my best and the virtues of education. After he left, I was afraid but very excited. Snuggled in my jacket under the street lamp, I waited for my ride. I could hear crickets and frogs in the ditch banks of the streets. I glanced at every car and truck passing, but the drivers kept moving. I jumped, trying to catch a moth fluttering above me. And when a stray dog came over to the, from the ditch, I gave it my peanut butter and jelly sandwich from my sack lunch. Here I was with no restraints, legally free for the first time in a long while. No cops, nuns, or un aunts or uncles looking for me to tell me what I had done wrong. It felt great being on the ditch as the sun was rising, but just as I was wondering whether I should head for the orphanage to find my brother, a lady drove up under the street lamp and waved to me. I went over toward her, running eager to warm my hands and the feet by the, uh, by the car heater. The dog followed, but I couldn't take it. I gave it my other sandwich which it gobbled up before we left and we turned away onto the street. School wasn't anything that I expected. Within a week, I, was, I faked being sick in order to stay out. The real reason I was ashamed, not only of my old patch clothes, but also because I didn't know anything the teachers were talking about. I couldn't talk to the kids because they were so much smarter than I was. They were the kind of kids my mother pointed to saying I should be like them. I already felt I already half believed that I was a sinner and they were not, at least the nuns had told me so. And because of all the trouble in my family, having no parents, the alcoholism and fights, I also believed there was something basically wrong with me. I didn't think anyone else had the kind of problems I had. So it seemed that everything that happened to me justified their view. And that's all I have. I'm Rick. Um, is this working? Okay. I'm Rachel uh, with Heather and three other amazing people. I was one of the people who chose this first year of five books for the Literature for Justice Committee. And I'm just br brought up Ayelet Walvin and Robin Levy, who are the two editors of Inside This Place, not of it, which is uh, one of our five books and from which Teresa just read. Um, which is so powerful. All that, I just want to say first, all the readers were so powerful and incredible and different from one another and yet related in really f essential ways. Um, and I'm just going to kind of um, ask each one of them questions. We'll proceed just down the line. Um, or well, I'll start from the end um, since Kalisha read first. So your novel was, it's technically a young adult novel correct? Um, and I know that you were a teacher. And the, the way that the novel is written is very engaging for an adult to read. But it's also written in an incredibly earthy style, which, by the way, is not that easy to affect. Just because it looks simple doesn't mean it's simple to construct such a thing. But it has an amazing readability. And I wondered if you wrote it sort of with your students in mind. Um, no, I actually. Um, when I initially wrote the book, it was, I didn't know that children would read it, or youth, young people, sorry. Um, because there was so much, I, I put it, I did write it with them in mind in terms of, um, I was surrounded by children in Harlem. I was teaching, kids were everywhere. 
Um, I was hearing them speak, hearing them talk, talking to them. <laughs> so a lot of that was happening. Um, but initially, uh, the book was, I, I, I had, I guess my age in mind, I was 25 at the time. There was a lot of cursing in the book. I, I kept it clean. It was hard to find a portion um, because, you know, that's what the kids do. So there was a lot of cursing and a lot of... Um, I see no need to keep things clean, but go on. <laughs> a lot of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, some sex and whatever. And so I thought that young people, I was kind of concerned when I initially found out young people were reading it because I was like, oh no, I would have done this and what done that. Um, so yeah, it was, it was accepted by the American Library Association and National Council of Teachers of English were the ones who pushed it to young people. And then at that point, it became a young people's uh, book. Uh, the adults loved it too, but it just really yeah. took off with the young people. Because they recognized something in it. I'm yeah, sure. yeah, That's so because. definitely I was surrounded by children and also it's set in the 90s when I was a young person. So, you know, reimagining that time and everything we went through as well. So. Yeah, but there are details in it that seem so realistic mm -hmm. to me. Um, like there's, well, there's a scene where he's, the boyfriend is talking about his lack of privacy, which Teresa also mm -hmm. just read really beautifully about. And I just wondered how you were able to imagine his these immediate concerns which are so real and yet other people might get caught up in um, less subtle effects of what happens to someone who's going into prison for the first time. It was, yeah, it was a very vivid um, kind of uh, possession. You know, when I wrote it, I was very, very uh, just taken by their voices kind of that came and uh, you know, I really couldn't stop them. It was all I thought about. It also helped that this was uh, my MFA thesis at the new school, so I had to complete it. <laughs> so that um, kind of aided the process. You know, I, I don't know. I, I really, I, I love the characters. I love Antonio and Natasha. I see parts of Antonio and men I've known and um, loved and, you know, a, a family, friends, you know, boyfriends, crushes. I see parts of Natasha, uh, myself in her, friends, women, yeah. you know, I've known, raised me. So, you know, they, they really, their voices are really this big mass of kind of, you know, all the, I, I was heartbroken by the statistic that there were more black men ages 18 to 24 in prison than college at the time you know right. i started writing it and so i just thought kind of of that ripple effect of the families and the communities and we're all doing time so it was a sweep of just you know everybody i know who could be affected by it kind of came out of their you know mouths and up in their letters right right james you um you're in a way, you're sort of, I think of you as uniquely positioned because you're very much a scholar of mass incarceration, as Heather pointed out, who is always taking part in, I read interviews with you and um, things are clarified for me that I actually can't really clarify anywhere else in terms of your ability to synthesize what's happening now uh, with mass incarceration and also with the discourse of critiques of prison. And you're also a formerly incarcerated person. Um, how do you see the role of books and getting people on board who are sort of insulated from these concerns? Or is that the role of literature? I don't know. Well, I, I mean, I actually wrote this book because I felt that a lot of the literature that I got about mass incarceration when I was in prison were things that I couldn't really share with other people in the prison yard. Not because they couldn't comprehend the ideas, but because they were written in a dense academic style, which I'm sure many yeah. people who are students or who have been students are familiar with some of the obstacles that that, that presents. So I thought, when I get out, I want to write something that's going to be accessible to people that, are, that I share that prison space with. So, I mean, I think that's one way, and I think we need to consider who's who's reading books yeah and if, if i mean it's one thing to write books that people read for enjoyment but it's another thing to think that you're writing books 
that are going to somehow contribute to the end of mass incarceration. And for that piece, you need to, people need to be ready to move beyond reading. And so I, I want to say two things about that. One is that uh, in that sense, we need to make sure that people are reading books before they get swept away by the school to prison pipeline, before they actually develop that reading capacity, because that's a big tragedy in terms of what impact can literature of any kind have or reading of any kind have when we are taking young people of color away from the opportunity to, to actually access that. And I think secondly is that, as I, as I, as I point out in that, in that excerpt, reading is not enough. We have so much more literature now than we had four or five years ago. I mean, I think the books that are represented on this, uh, you know, here are illustrative of how much more. In 2012, I felt I could read everything that came out on mass incarceration. Now I can't even read everything that comes out on mass incarceration in a day. So it's, it's, it's overwhelming. But data and information does not equal social change. Yeah. If it did, we'd have, a, we'd have a massive movement against climate change right now because all the scientific evidence is on our side, but we don't have that movement. So the same thing with mass incarceration. The literature is important, the books are important, but we need organizations and we need people that can make what's in that information make it a force for, for change. So I think there are some national organizations that are attempting to do this, particularly organizations of formerly incarcerated folks, All of Us or None, Just Leadership USA, the National Council of Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls, but it's still not enough to affect the change because essentially we have almost the same amount of people in prison now as we did 10 years ago. Can't argue with any of that. Um, Antonio, uh, you are here to represent your father, but I know you also are very involved with and concerned with the issues yourselves, and you grew up with a father whose transformation you witnessed. Do you want to talk about what that was like? <clears throat> yeah, so, uh, so, you know, he was pretty much already, you know, I would say, well, I don't know if he was 100% transformed, you know, because he still, you know, gets a little wild every now and then, but <laughs> not so much anymore, obviously. But, uh, but yeah, I just want to say that the transport or the transformation from, you know, that time he was able to actually, uh, you know, kind of help other folks that have been previously in his, sh or that have been in his shoes previously to try to help them to not make the same mistakes and to find, uh, you know, to kind of find their self-worth and their, their own self being and well-being, you know, in finding themselves in literature because I think that the, you know, that the common theme there is, and it is apparent in today's social media world, everybody wants to feel some sort of worth. I think that everybody's kind of, you know, wants, you know, a certain amount of likes or whatever the case is. Everybody wants a, a pat on the back at work to say, well done. You know, I think that all that's ingrained in all of us, you know, from an early age. So I think that when people don't get that, you know, when they're, uh, you know, at a youth and they're, you know, basically looking for that at such a pivotal point in their life and they don't get that, I feel like that's the time then that kids tend to go off the deep end. Uh, so that being said, you know, my pops has come into contact with numerous folks that had just come out of jail and they're all trying to, or not all of them, but some people that, you know, make contact with them, try to find their voice through literature. And I just think that it's a uh, really amazing and astonishing the changes that, you know, that can be had through finding yourself through literature. Uh, for one, I think that it gives people the opportunity to feel empathy uh, to what other people feel. Especially, I think that's especially important for people who have never really been in situations like a Christmas dinner or things like that. Um, so yeah, you know, just seeing it firsthand, I think that it's meant a lot. And I think that, you know, even though my dad writes books, he loves to write the books, but I think that his real true passion is actually being there in the prisons, actually helping people and seeing, you know, opposite gang members and everybody else who would normally be enemies on the, on the actual, uh, you know, in the open area, but now they're together talking about, you know, maybe a poem that they wrote or a part of their childhood that they wrote, and now they're able to talk about it and, you know, set their feelings aside that, 
they might hate each other like outside the prison walls, but in there they're kind of like all is one. So I think that that's all very important. Ayelet and Robin and Teresa, I was going to sort of formulate a question first for you two and then for her, but since you all worked on the same project essentially together, um, could, could you two talk just a little about how the idea for this project of doing oral histories of um, people in women's prison came about um, and what it was like doing the interviews and then putting together these incredible narratives that resulted from them. It really was just a matter of um, we uh, we were, I, I read one of the Voice of Witness books. Um, I read the, um, I, and once I read one, which was on undocumented um, workers and on immigrants, I delved into the whole series and I thought, well, I know what's missing here. And I went to Dave Eggers and Mimi Locke and I said, can we, and I had this idea that it would be really easy. I said, listen, we can do a book on um, human rights violations in women's prisons. And my friend Robin is a human rights lawyer and she goes into the prisons all the time and the two of us can just whip this thing out one, two, three, no big deal. We know lots of people. And then three years, three years later, um, it was incredibly challenging because the thing about the prison industrial complex is it doesn't want people to know what's going on in the prison. Right. It doesn't want people to understand the extent of the human rights violations that people experience on a day-to-day -day basis. So even getting into the prisons to interview people was incredibly onerous. So we did it under cloak of legal visits because we're both lawyers. Um, in California. In California. That's how we did it. Um, but then uh, the rest of the country, we couldn't necessarily do it that way. So, um, I mean, we do want to talk a little bit about the just ridiculous lengths yeah. we had to go to. It was it was absolutely extraordinarily difficult to do this. And I, I like a yellow, thought it was going to be fairly simple. I've been doing this stuff for um, more than 10 years. I went to conferences all around the country. I regularly talked to people from all different states about, you know, similar abuses. I thought we just reach out, we get a bunch of people, and we interview them, and that'd be it. And, and that was, as Ayala said, very, very far from it. It was um, every single state had the most Byzantine regulations about getting in every level. Some of them you couldn't bring any recording equipment in. Some you could only bring, so in California, you could only bring this micro disc in, which is, you know, not made anymore. And we so we kind of cornered the market on eBay. We had interns whose sole job was to search eBay for this obsolete audio equipment, which was the only audio equipment permitted that we were permitted to bring into the prisons. So that, I mean, that's all they did was just look, oh, there's one, a micro disc recorder, you know, circa 1985 or whatever. Because once it was open, you couldn't use that one again. So we had to keep buying. Um, and we had some, many of them, you only, only lawyers could come in. One, it was like you could only use like an old school recorder or a laptop, which I thought was funny. I was like decades of technology in between this. Um, and, and, and so that was, it was very difficult. And then, and then getting in, like I said, sometimes you, ha you only could bring lawyers in and even then they had to go through many, many steps. And so it was very, very difficult for us to get access to people inside the prisons. In addition, um, because um, we're dealing with folks who had dealt with human rights abuses, and some of them were um, in lawsuits, many of their attorneys were, were reluctant to let us have access to, um, to the folks inside, which, which I totally understood. Um, and I, I, we were very grateful to Voice of Witness, actually, for allowing us to do, use letter narratives, which we had never done because we just were desperate. We were getting letters, and we were getting letters from people all over the country, from people in women's prisons all over the country, desperate to participate in our pro project. And so we had set up this system and I remember at one point we got a letter, we, we sent, and, and you know, it, all of this stuff costs money. So we would send a letter in, we'd send in lined paper and an addressed stamped envelope so that the folks inside could write back. And um, in Colorado, they confiscated that and they wouldn't our blank get paper. our blank paper and our, you know, stamped envelope and said to the, to the, to the person that if we sent that in again, they would throw it out and she wouldn't be allowed to get any letters from us uh. at all. Um, I will say that Colorado was under a lawsuit from the ACLU for their mailing itch issues. Um, but we were able to do one letter narrative uh, um, for, for a person who was in um, like a very hard to reach part of a very hard to reach state. Um, and, and we were grateful for that and that was beautiful. But I do wanna emphasize, and I always emphasize this, that the one place that there was never any reluctance was of the folks, from the folks inside. 
Um, and we actually, because of the difficulty, we also interview, interviewed people who were recently released from, from women's prisons. But in each case, there was no reluctance from, from them. And, and we're talking about four to five hour interviews, um, sometimes multiple four to five hour interviews, right, Teresa, to do this. And yeah, and, and just really difficult. And they were all so eager. For one person, it was her first stop after being released from prison. Her first stop was to come and meet with um, our interviewer in order to do that because she had she had made connection inside and she, she couldn't do it when she was inside and that was her first stop was to do this interview it was that important and so um, there was and never Teresa was also inside. Well, Teresa was invaluable in that sense because yes. Teresa um, from inside over the phone on speakerphone did trainings for our interviewers because you know when you're these interviews are very long and they're very wide ranging, but they encompass the most traumatic periods of people's lives. And in the context, especially of a prison, um, you can't sort of have someone flay themselves in front of, you know, ask them all of the most intimate questions, cause them to relive those traumas, and then just say, oh, bye, see you later, go back inside and you'll get searched on your way in. So Teresa really taught us all how to, um, you know, it was kind of like that uh, uh, campground analogy, you know, leave it in better shape than you got there, than when you got there. I mean, T Teresa really helped us all to understand how our role wasn't just to get these interviews, but to also to take care of the people we were interviewing, to give, just as they honored us with their stories, to honor them with uh, the respect to help them get to a place where they could tolerate the life that they were returning to. Yeah, I just want to add two more things. One is that Teresa's Do's and Don'ts, which was the title of it, is used by many human rights clinics, legal human rights clinics in the country. Um, they, it started dis being distributed around Yale, asked for it, and then it kind of spread further. So um, um, a rock star in many ways is Teresa. But I also want to say that despite all those difficulties, we did end up getting narratives from all the major regions in the country, from, from the West, from the Northwest, from the Southwest, from the Midwest, from the Northeast, from the Mid-Atlantic. Um, we, we covered, we did actually end up covering, covering the whole thing. Spoiler country. alert, it sucks everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to talk about that a little bit, Teresa? Um, that's your mic, I think. Um, I, uh, I, <coughs> Mimi Loke is, I guess, is the director of Voice of Witness. And um, I saw her the other day in San Francisco and mentioned this occasion. And she said, we couldn't have done it without Teresa, because she trained our interns, and we can't run the operation and put out the book without them. And that you were kind of like the, um, you were the mentor. Um, can you talk about that a little? And also um, just how you learned, I mean, your own training, listening to other women, and having, uh, sorry to put it in a corny way, but such a big heart for other people and where they're coming from. And even people who, because I know you, I know are very different than you. Is that something that you just developed <laughs> over the years of being in institutions? Because it's clearly something that you had that you could bring to the table as not just one of the interviewed subjects, but somebody who really helped them well, to put think, this book together. I think that, like, um, I've always been a very kind person, I think, until I got into gangbanging really bad, and then I started hardening up, and being an ex-gang member and having to live in a lot of trauma and having a very colorful background, you tend to harden up. And when I started going institution, into institutions at the age 12, I've been in every juvenile hall in LA. I've been to Youth Authority. From Youth Authority, I went to adult prison. I gave them 23 years of my life. I've now been out seven years now, and it's a miracle. But I, I went through different, different emotional growths in my life in there. You tend to become a different person, and you want to revert back to who you really are, and then you have to revert back to this like defensive person. It's just all a part of a, a defense mechanism to survive in prison because the, the walls, when you're inside, you don't have the support that you need. They don't want people in the free world to understand or know anything about what's going on, like the sterilization, for one thing. Who would think that this really happened, the Department of Corrections pa practicing eugenics in America? And people say, no, that's not happening. Yes, it is. 
Yes, it is. We have women who have been sterilized through the Department of Corrections. And so um, when I was asked to interview for this book, at first I was very hesitant. I said, what is it going to matter? Nobody wants to hear our stories. And if they do hear our stories, they're not going to care. And this is the frame of mind that I was in because I had no clue. I had no clue that there is passionate people like the ones that are sitting in this room right now that, are, that do want to hear about what goes on in the prison system. And people like Rachel Kushner who do care about what happens to us, women of color especially, that are treated and we're misjudged and we're discriminated and we're treated um, harshly. Even our reentry is horrible. And the government has set up the system to where we come out with $200 and what are you supposed to do with $200 and you live in LA and they got us housed in Central California. So by the time we get home, we have to report to the parole department. We're late. We get violated. And, you're so, and you come out from after doing six years like me, and you have no clothing, no food, no nothing, no family members. And so what are you supposed to do? You revert back to eventually, within 90 days, you revert back to what you know how to do best. And that's either selling dope, prostitution, getting up to, into an abusive relationship where you're getting beat up every day just to be able to live somewhere. And these are the things that are really happening out there. And like um, Mr. Kilgore said, we need organizations. We need more organizations. We need more people to understand what's happening in the prison system. And we need the help out here so when the women and the men come out, they get the support they needed. Because just like me, I have Rachel, I have Violet, I have Rachel Kushner, I have Cynthia Chandler. These are all people that if I didn't have them, I would not be sitting here right now. And it's the truth because I would be back doing what I'm comfortable with. I'm, I would be back doing what's fastest for me. And I would revert back to doing the things that are going to help me survive. Because living on 221 or even 920 on SSI that I'm on now, because I'm a mental, uh, mental health uh, uh, recipient, but it, even 9-something doesn't help you survive right. I don't know how they expect us to live. But when they asked me to interview for this book, like I said, I was very hesitant because I didn't think anybody cared and anybody wanted to hear what our stories were. A lot of us women come from a lot of trauma. And um, we see counselors and we see set therapists and we're in programs and we go to all these different self-help groups. But nothing really hits the root of your problem until you know that there's people who really care. That's the key is when you can hit the root because you know people really care about you, people love you, and they want to help you become the person that you're supposed to be, not the person you were made into or molded into. They help you become the person that you're supposed to be in society, and that's when you're able to start being successful, and that's when you're able to jump into your change. And there's just not enough people out there Mass incarceration is real. It's like these people are getting locked up and coming out to absolutely nothing. Skid Row. They're being placed in Skid Row. How do you place somebody in Skid Row and you walk out and you got drug dealers and drug users and prostitution and pimps and everything else out there and you expect somebody that just came out from doing five years to survive in that? There's no way. So um, I, when I did this interview, I figured, well, I can handle it. But when I had to sit there, because I've talked so much about my life, and I was so comfortable <coughs> about talking about my mother being a dolphin and me starting prostitution at age 12 and being HIV diagnosed and finding out 12 years later I did not even never had the disease and taking all those meds and there was nothing for it to target. And now I'm suffering dearly behind the harsh medication I was on. Um, but I'm glad that I did do it. I'm glad that the book is out and a lot of people have read it and our, our voices and our messages being sent out and people are coming forward. People are wanting to support people into re-entry. And I feel even if like, if I can get across to just one person in my life, then I've done what I was supposed to do. I think that's a great place to end. And also, I got the signal that it was time to end. Um, what happens now? 
Okay, sorry. <laughs> So one last round of applause for all of our selectors and authors. Um, and I think just um, the one thing I will say is that obviously we want you to read these books, but to your point of that reading alone won't really do anything. Um, read with perhaps the intention of being moved and acting. Um, we're having a reception. We're not going to call it a party because I feel like a party for justice is not really a thing. Um, at the library bar down the block. So please join us if you are free. Thank you all for coming. Buy books and sign them. The authors will be signing the books outside. <laughs>